We are so excited to bring this webinar to you today. We are talking about why diets don't work and whether that is a new concept to you or you are very clear that that is truth. This is a really awesome way for us to just break down the science of what's going on. I know for me, it helps a lot to have a scientific backing to the things that help me feel better about my wellness journey and my relationship with food and wellness. And this is your massive permission slip to never have to diet again. So we are so excited to bring this to you. I cannot wait to hear everything that Katie has to bring to the table. Before we jump in, I have a quick announcement. We are about three weeks out from launching our next round of our 10-week Clarity Fitness Body Positive Wellness course. And that is a really, really amazing platform of lots of different things going on from food to fitness to self-care to body image all in a health at every size and forward body positive light. And we are very excited to bring that to the Clarity community starting in June. So if you are interested in that, in that, let me know, message me, and I can get you the link to get all signed up. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Katie Hake, a haze informed non-diet-based nutritionist. She's also an amazing body diversity and fitness empowerment specialist, and I'm honored to be in her network. So thank you so much for making time today. Hey, Katie. Thank you for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. Um, hopefully you guys can see it. Okay. Let me know. Do you see, what do you see? A beautiful see plate. That, yep. A beautiful plate that I did not make. I wish my food looked like that, but <laughs> hi, thank you for having me. Um, so today we're going to talk about why diets don't work, right? And maybe you're, you've been with Clarity for some time and you're familiar with the concepts of intuitive eating. You know, we're going to touch on this, but really my goal for you today is to walk away with a lot of self-reflection, a lot of understanding how this applies to you and what can you take with this information, right? So I tangible tips of how to really adopt this non-diet mentality and get into that mindset of finding what does, what does work, right? What changes will impact your health from a all-inclusive um, way? So some of our goals for today, whoops, there we go, um, you know, is to look at some of the science, look at some of that research, right? Behind dieting, behind intentional weight loss. You know, if you've ever experienced any guilt, any shame, any frustration over your body, over your weight, over your food choices, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. And today, I, I also hope that you just get fired up a little bit because recognizing that this is a bigger issue, um, a bigger problem, a bigger fight that we're, that we're going to you know fight towards. But how do we spot a diet in disguise, right? It's one thing to recognize that why diets don't work. And of course, we'll talk about that. But how do we recognize it as the industry starts to get a little bit sneakier? I'm going to give you five specific you know, strategies that you can implement today to help you really work towards that diet, that getting rid of that diet mentality. And then of course, leave time um, for some Q&A as well. So, and of course, if anything comes up in the chat box, feel free. Um, I'll let Abby be the, the moderator of that uh, to, to, uh, let me know if I need to answer anything right away. So a little bit about me. You're like, who is this lady? Uh, my name is Katie Hake. I am a non-diet dietitian. Um, I used to work in a variety of settings in the clinical setting, working with um, everywhere from newborn babies who had rare metabolic disorders to adults. And um, I've actually worked in a weight loss clinic as well, working with people who have had bariatric surgery. So I've seen a lot of how dieting impacts um a lot of different ages, a lot of different populations, right? A lot of the physical impacts, a lot of the mental and emotional impacts as well. So something that I really get fired up about is breaking down the science, making it easy to understand how does it apply to you? How to put it into words that make sense that you can then take this information and share with it with your family, your friends, you know, in your circle of people. Um, I myself have definitely struggled with 
that all or nothing thinking. Um, you know, I was never formally diagnosed with orthorexia or exercise addiction, but I can for sure look back over the years and realize, wow, I was not in a good place with food. I, I was, I wore healthy eating like a badge of honor, right? And really what would be categorized more as, you know, obsessive, healthy eating, um, using exercise as a means of focusing on weight loss or manipulating or shrinking my body versus, you know, I, I put this picture of me because I love this picture of me. I think I feel for me, I feel the strongest when I'm lifting weights. And I look at that picture now, and I'm like, there's got to be heavier weights on that barbell. But that's beside the point. You know, I believe that all foods can fit, all foods should fit, right? And, and, there's a way of eating that's right for you that can make you feel your best, not just physically, but looking at the mental, emotional pieces of food as well. Um, a piece that I do that I'm really excited about is making an impact on the industry level. That's why I love Abby and the work that you guys are doing at Clarity, because like I said, this is a bigger issue. And so part of my role is working with trainers on um more of an industry level to educate on eating disorder awareness, on body positivity, because I think it we, we've got to start from the top, right? We've got to um, start in our conversations that we have with each other, but also what are we doing in this industry? What are we doing with um, our health industry as a whole? Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And let's div dive into what, like I said, we're going to talk about today. So we're going to dig into some of that science, you know, if diets were analyzed, what's funny, if they were analyzed with that same inspection as medications on the market, they would never be on the market. They would never be recommended to public. And so we're going to talk about like what is actual some of the research says. And I want to take some of that research today and apply it to you and your story and help you feel fired up um, today. So I think we can agree that I think we can both agree, all agree that you are here because you've been there, done that. You know, you probably know that diets don't work, but maybe you only understand your personal journey. So we're like I said, we're going to look at the research behind what did that diet say? And, you know, many people are actually very aware that dieting doesn't work in the long run, but most are actually surprised to learn that dieting actually increases your risk of gaining even more weight. And since actually the 1940s, there is a large body of research that has shown that the act of dieting promotes weight gain in a, like I said, a variety of age groups from teens to adults. And really what we've seen is that weight cycling, right? Or think of the up and down of, of weight over months or even years, that itself is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, inflammation, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, yet it's rarely controlled for in a lot of the studies that associate weight with health issues. Um, and I love a good little meme. Those always make me laugh. So again, we're looking at pills. You know, I mentioned that if right right now, at the time of this recording, there is a pandemic, right? And they're looking at vaccines and a lot of, anal you know, I think a lot of that's coming to light about how things are analyzed by the FDA and how, you know, medications are looked at with, with a magnifying glass. And it's amazing when we look at how often in the medical field, and maybe you've experienced this in your own experience with doctors, that you've been prescribed a diet. You've been prescribed you know, low carb, or you've been told to cut out sugar, right? Something like that, that blanket statement of prescribing. Imagine if you had asthma, right? And you were prescribed, like I said, a medication that improved your breathing for a few weeks, but in the long run, it ended up causing you more asthma attacks um, and ultimately long-term damage to your lungs. I kind of like to use that same analogy as dieting. You know, would you blame yourself for the medications not working? No, probably not. <laughs> you wouldn't blame yourself and you wouldn't continue to take the meds, right? If it wasn't working. And so it's kind of what it's like to diet regardless of who prescribes it. You know, would you really go on a diet if you knew that it ultimately would fail? Because the pursuit of and focus on weight loss can be harmful. You know, we're not just talking about to your body, but with your mind, your relationship with food and your mind as well. Um, according to Fiona Willer, she's an Australian expert dietitian in this field. I definitely highly recommend. She's called the mindful dietitian um, on Instagram. She's a great follow, but she said that, you know, the American National Health and Medical Research Council rated the research between diets and weight gain level A evidence. 
which is the scientific equivalent of smoking causing lung cancer. So I thought that was very powerful to just recognize, okay, wow, there is actually research out there that supports that this idea of restricting is not beneficial to our health. So, you know, you've maybe seen this before, this term that 95% of diet of diets fail, and we're going to unpack what that means in a little bit. But when I think of failure, you know, I want you to think about yourself. What does that mean to you? And I'd love to hear in the comments, you know, what does that mean to you when you think of diets fail? Have you had your own experience where you felt like you failed a diet? Um, you know, for most people, what that means is gaining back the weight that they lost or not being able, you know, to sustain it. Um, the weight loss industry itself, I pulled this statistic from 2020, was worth $71 billion. <laughs> $71 billion, you know? And so when we think about that from a marketing perspective, right, who's benefiting from this? You know, these are just a few of, I think, more of the trendier programs that are out there. And maybe it's different, you know, in your area where you live, maybe there's even new ones, but the industry is getting even, they're picking up on that, you know, intuitive eating and a non-diet approach. They're picking up that people don't resonate with that word dieting anymore. And so that's why we as consumers have to be even more mindful of what is a diet? Because marketers are just going to continue to switch it and manipulate it and call it something else and call it a lifestyle change. And so I hope today too, that you walk away with really being aware of what are some of those red flags that I should be looking for because it's ultimately a diet in disguise. So we know that diets lead to increased risk of eating disorders body dissatisfaction or think poor body image, which shout out um, with the body image piece. I think Abby will def definitely has a lot of resources, resources for that as well, but it increases our thoughts and our thinking about food, um, our cravings for food. You know, think about if you've, I used to work in a, a hospital setting where there was a big red button, like right at a toddler's height, right? And they would always tell the kids, you know, don't press that button, but it's like, oh my gosh, you put a big red button, like without a little case over it that says, do not press and right at their eye level, what happens? We start thinking about that. We get fixated on that. And that same thing happens with food. Um, there's a research study that, you know, I encourage everybody to check it out if, if you're bored one day, but it's called the keys study. And they did this back in world war II. They were studying you know, what, what are, how are we going to refeed people at, after the war? How do we rehabilitate these people after a famine? And what they found is that when they restricted these physically healthy men, mentally healthy men, they restricted them. I think it was, it wasn't even what you see now some days as far as a low, low calorie, but they restricted their intake. And even within a few weeks, a lot of these men developed disordered thoughts around food, we're hoarding food, we're, you know, saving up recipes and counting things. Oh, you know, it, some of them even had symptoms. And so what we know, you know, think back to that time, that's World War II. They didn't have Instagram, they didn't have social media and so much more of that influence. And so I always think that I'll, I'll be sure to send that study out as well. But I think that's so fascinating if we can even think, if we can pick back from that far that these people had some of these same symptoms from dieting and they didn't even have me social media or, or the impacts that we do. And so the focus on weight loss, you know, really can distract us from other personal health goals. And it also affects the way that we unconsciously treat others in larger bodies. You know, dieting is, I believe, hands down, the quickest way to short circuit a healthy relationship with food. I actually just got off a call with a, a new client right before this. And she was saying, we were reflecting on her history with um, growing up. And she said, you know, Katie, I felt like I ate all varieties of foods growing up. I ate dinner with my family. We had a really pot. We ate all sorts of foods. We ate sloppy joe, spaghetti. Like we had dessert. I don't know why now here I am, you know, she's 23 years old. Why do I now have all these what I would consider disordered thoughts around food and like this obsession with healthy eating. 
we always think maybe it's our family, you know, you know, our families can sometimes can be a source and we'll talk more about this later, but our society is a big piece of it. So we'll talk, we'll reflect a little bit more. You know, I want to do a quick um, note on BMI because I think this ties into when those situations, when diets are prescribed, and I highly recommend checking out the previous webinar with Kelsey Gilbert on BMI. But remember, if you have been in a situation where they've talked about BMI, you know, particularly in the health field, um, this was developed <laughs> 200 years ago by a mathematician, not a doctor. You know, it's simply a ratio of your height to weight. And it's looking at, it was meant to assess population trends, not your individual health status. And so overweight or obese does not mean unhealthy. And I just, I, I know you've probably heard that before, but I've said it once. I'm going to say it again, because um, so often we tie and we associate our health to that number. And really the goal of adopting this non-diet mentality is, can I get away from getting fixated on the numbers? Because we know that there's so much more that impacts our health. Um, okay. So let's compare our diet cycle to this pendulum. What happens when you pull a pendulum to one end? Maybe does anyone ever have one of those like marble things? I had one growing up. But if you pull a pendulum to one end, right, it's going to swing to the other side with equal force. And maybe you can relate to this as well, either with your eating patterns or with your weight. But what happens is that then our body has to continually adjust and it continually readapts. And every time you do this, you're training your body to ignore your body, your biological signals. And so if we continue to ignore them long enough, right, those biological signals, meaning hunger, fullness, um, maybe a loss of a period could be a, a biological sign, hair loss, um, feeling really cold, changes in body temperature. I mean, there's so many things that our bodies do to get our attention, right? To tell us that something's not right. Um, our body's going to go into survival mode or plateau or what we, you know, we see as lowering that metabolic rate. And the harder that you try restricting foods, think about hanging out on the left side of this pendulum, the more your body and your mind will adapt to surviving this, you know, self-imposed famine. You know, it's like, I love analogies, right? It's like holding your breath. You, you have this illusion, right? Think about when you, you're a little kid and you hold your breath and go underwater, right? You have this illusion that of willpower, like, okay, I can limit my breathing. Like I can hold on to this for this much longer. Right. But at some point your body, your body can't take it. Your body says no. And you have to come up for air because our bodies need air to survive. And that same thing with eating, you know, we can hold on, right. Will ourselves for the, but for so long, but ultimately biology will win every time. Right. And those cues or something will happen that will then cause the body, right? Or maybe it feels chaotic to then eat, right? Because that body, whether it's a physical or also we'll talk about physical, but also that mental restriction around food as well. And so when we think of terms of dieting, you know, for anybody who's maybe new to this concept, think about these patterns. We're going to take some time to reflect on your own patterns, you know, throughout life. But what does it feel like to hang out on this left side of the pendulum? Why don't you guys just like write that down? What does that feel like? Um, maybe it feels like control. Maybe it feels like, um, maybe it feels good for a little bit, right? Maybe it feels overwhelming, stressful, right? Think about, I want you to reflect for yourself. Like what are some of those words that come to mind when you personally have dieted or You've been kind of in that diet mindset. And then what does it feel like on this other side, right? This chaotic overeating. Um, some of my clients will use the word, it feels out of control. It feels chaotic. It feels like guilt. It feels um, like stress, right? And so think, okay, what would it be like to live more in the middle, right? Because when we can let go of that, diet mentality the goal is that okay can i have less of these big swings you know and i think of those swings in terms of swings in your weight swings in those biological cues right really hungry really full 
swings in your mood, you know, hangry, <laughs> angry, right? Like think about just those big swings, right? In terms of that feeling physically, that terms of, of mentally, emotionally, what would it feel like? What would it look like to live more here, right? Would it feel more calm? Would it feel more um, at ease? Would it feel more peaceful? And so I want you to start to think of that, just some of those words for, for yourself. I also love this visual. I think this picture is a little bit blurry, but this is from the book Body Kindness by Rebecca Scritchfield. And I highly recommend this book um, for anybody who struggles with that compassion piece. We'll talk about this a little bit more, right? But if we're looking at that pendulum, a lot of times this cycle starts here, right? It starts at this end of the pendulum where something happens, something triggers that goes, ugh, I don't feel good about my body, you know? Um, I've got to do something. And that often pulls us to then swing to the other side of the pendulum, right? You start thinking about food, you start to ignore those hunger cues. And this path, you know, again, take a picture, hold, look over this at your own time. But again, it just ultimately says that the body is smart, the body is so smart, and it will do what it needs to, to fight that biology will win because our bodies ultimately are on our side. So I say all this, you know, I want you to know that you have not failed, okay? Diets have failed you in this illusion that there's a perfect way of eating and that you have to look a certain way, you have to eat a certain way, you have to move a certain way because that's the key to health, right? And if if that were the case, um, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't, none of us would be talking about food, right? Because we wouldn't have that issue to begin with. And so when we talk about that word failure, I want you to maybe take some time, if you're watching this on the recording, you know, pause what does that word failure mean to you? And we're going to do an exercise later to reflect on, on that in your own life, but you can't fail at this process that we're going to talk about, you know, we'll touch on intuitive eating, but you can't fail at it because that's where that diet mindset goes. And so if you find yourself getting discouraged or feeling overwhelmed, remind yourself that I can't fail at this because I am now at a place where I'm in it for the long game. You know, I'm, I'm working on changing the way that I look at food, the way I look at exercise, the way I look at my body. And I can't fail this. You know, every day is an experience. Every day is a learning opportunity to learn about myself, learn about an, an environment, learn about a different type of food. And so if you can go into this with an open mind, that will really very much um, serve you well long-term. So insert intuitive eating we're going to do could just kind of a quick recap on this because i think every time that we do learn about intuitive eating at least for me in this process every time i heard it i, I learned something different and it resonated resonates at a different time in your life whatever you're experiencing today that maybe you didn't experience at the last time that you um, heard about intuitive eating so intuitive eating is really a compassionate self-care you know it's a framework that treats all bodies and dignity with respect. So it was actually developed by, you know, it's nothing new. It was developed in the 90s by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. Those are the two, two gals on the um, book cover. So I, I guess 90s, I guess you could say it's fairly new in a sense, but, um, you know, it's ultimately these guidelines. And it's very easy, even with the reason I bring up intuitive eating is because I've seen a lot of people try to turn intuitive eating into a diet, you know, but intuitive eating at its core, there's over a hundred studies on intuitive eating and the research is only growing, you know, um, I'll point you to more resources at, at the end of today, but I will definitely say if you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend it as well because it does, it gives so many just tangible tips and other, you know, real life experiences of people who've gone through the same thing that maybe you're experiencing. And I think it's really when you're doing this work, starting out, it can feel isolating, it can feel like you're alone. Um, it can feel like maybe the those closest to you in your home or your friends circle, don't feel the same way around food. And for them, maybe it's very simple, they just say eat this, not that. And why are you overcomplicating it? But the reality is that it's not that simple for a lot of people. And um, you're not alone. And hopefully that, that's why you're here as well, right? Because you're, you're smart and you're plugging into some of those resources. So, you know, of course we know that with intuitive eating, there's so many different benefits, but in addition to getting away from that diet mindset is you also start to learn what foods that you truly like and dislike. 
you know, you have less of that mental energy spent thinking about food. You've got more energy, less cravings, better relationships, you know, with, with food, with exercise, but also improved mood and, you know, better digestion. And so while this journey, I don't know where you're on your journey right now, but the journey looks so different for each person. I continue to see these outcomes uh, time and time again. And so it may, maybe you're just starting out and you're, you're, you're on this webinar because you're like, all right, I'm, I'm buying into the fact diets don't work. Okay, I get it. But maybe even after reading some of the research or hearing some of the statistics, you're like, I hear you, I get it, but I don't get it. Like, so I want you to just recognize that this journey looks different for everybody. And the more that you continue to learn them about stats, yes, stats and facts, but reflecting on your own journey and your own self, that's where um, really the magic happens. So again, these are the quick 10 principles of intuitive, intuitive eating. If you're not familiar with it, like I said, I would encourage you to go back, watch some of the other webinars or check out the book itself. Um, so another piece I want to touch on, because I think it's so integral to this work of getting away from diets and looking at a lot of the research on dieting is this health at every size. So you may see it as haze. Um, it's this approach to weight. It's an alternative to approach to weight centered treatment. So if you are, maybe you've had a doctor's appointment where they prescribed a diet, remember that you, you're the boss, you get to decide um, who you seek care from. And so I'd highly encourage you if you haven't already check out the Hayes directory. You can actually, you know, just Google Hayes and it'll pull up a website where you can actually find physicians, therapists. Um, I'm sure Abby's got race, great resources as well of connecting you with people who align with your health goals, right? Because we know that, you know, dieting doesn't work to improve your health, but you can still want to improve your health without being on a diet. So Hayes really looks at some of these, these big focuses, but accepting and respecting the diversity of different body shapes and sizes, rejecting um, that I idealization of a certain body type. And it's, you know, looking at, again, some of those systemic changes. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. So diving into, like, how do we actually, okay, if we recognize that diets don't work, how do I start to pull away from really that diet mentality? And maybe you've heard this term diet culture. So I want to take a moment to talk about, you know, what is diet culture? And according to Christy Harrison, she's another intuitive eating counselor. She's a host of the Food Psych podcast, which you may or may not have listened to. She says that diet culture is a system of beliefs that worships thinness and equates it to health and moral virtue, which means that, you know, you can spend your whole life thinking that you're broken just because you don't look like somebody, just because you don't look like this thin ideal. You know, diet culture promotes weight loss as a way of attaining this higher status, right? So, you know, just that alone, that trying to maintain this weight loss, a certain image, you feel compelled to spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money towards shrinking your body, even though the research is, like we've said, is very clear that almost no one can sustain intentional weight loss for more than a few years. Um, you know, this diet culture really demonizes certain ways of eating. Maybe you've experienced this, right? Demonizes one way of eating and elevates another, which means that, you know, you're, if we're looking at one as good versus bad, then you're forced to be hyper-focused about your eating, right? Ashamed of eating certain food choices that maybe aren't as elevated. Um, and ultimately this culture, this environment it oppresses people who don't match up with this supposed picture of health, right? Which we know disproportionately harms women, LGBTQ persons, people with larger bodies, people of color, people with disabilities, and it damages both mental health and physical health. So, okay, if your brain hurts a little bit, <laughs> I want you to think of diet culture this way. It is, you know, a five-year-old who didn't eat her mom's homemade cookie in her lunchbox because she was afraid of what her teacher would think. Um, it's weigh-ins at school or at gyms that can trigger shame in both kids and both adults. It's strangers commenting on your food choices. It's strangers heckling a marathon runner because she's in a larger body. It's turkey burn classes, right, that we see show up around the holidays. It's pressure on new brides to be at a certain size or 
you know, fit into a certain wedding dress on, on the wedding day. It's pressure on new moms to get their, you know, pre-baby body back. It's this talk about food plans and diets in every single social settings from the office cubicles to church, you know, from school to weddings. It's, it's this talk around food and bodies like it's the norm, right? And so it's the nonstop dialogue and apologizing for what you, your body or what you're about to eat or what you just ate. And like I said before, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy. There's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good. But the problem is that this diet culture has hijacked the word health. You know, health has become synonymous with weight, either losing weight or being lean, which ultimately restricts what you eat. And so the key is going to be, you know, shifting the focus to the practices, to the habits that support health, because we know that weight itself is not a behavior. And so I want you to ask yourself and reflect. And if you've got a journal, awesome, you know, or write taking notes, but how has diet culture shown up in your life, either in your beliefs, in your relationships, your experiences at work, at home, et cetera. Because I think when we can put it into sort of that perspective, it can help us take some of that power back a little bit we can start to recognize where do I see it? Where are ways that I can either distance myself from it or put some of these practices that we're going to talk about into place? Because like we said, like I said before, remember weight is not a behavior. There's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good, but can we focus on those habits? So I want you to get out a piece of paper if you haven't already. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to set a little timer, like two minutes. I need like Jeopardy music or something. And sorry, I can't sit still if you see me like keep moving up and down because I can't sit still in my chair. So I want you to think about if you've done this exercise before, awesome. If you haven't, um, this can be a really powerful exercise. You definitely need more than two minutes. But I want you to think of the very first time that you felt negative about your body. Maybe it was your mom taking you to Weight Watchers in high school, or maybe it was sooner, you know, a girl in grade school asking or girl or boy, you know, asking, why is your body different? So I want you to create this timeline of what you've been through, starting in childhood, if you can, you know, write down the earliest time or memory of food or dieting, um, you know, whether it's positive, negative, neutral, right? You know, we're just kind of bringing awareness here to helping you kind of put some pieces or, or you know, connect the dots to your own story. But I want you to reflect on how much time, how much energy, how much money that has been spent on dieting. What have you gotten back from all that time dieting? Was it a good investment for you, right? Sometimes um, people will look back on their timeline and go, well, actually, you know, I met with somebody once and they actually did they did explain to me what a carbohydrate was and that was helpful you know so there's pieces that maybe you can pull out that were helpful but can you also pull out what was harmful you know what are things that you learned um one way or another maybe you can pull out on your timeline maybe there were times that you had experiences around food that were contradicting <laughs> right it was like at one point, I was told to do low carb. At another point, I was introduced to carb cycling, and they said eat more carbs in this day. And so, can you look back and just look at those different, you know, points in your life? And maybe one was more impactful than the others. But you know, again, just writing that out, taking time to reflect. What What's my story? What's my story with food? What's my story with my body? Because I think in order to move forward it's really important for us to understand, cut out the noise. <laughs> what, what is, what matters to me? Right. And where am I feeling stuck? Where am I feeling tangled that maybe I need to spend a little bit more time untangling and maybe, maybe this timeline can help you identify what were some of those moments where you were the source of some of those rules or um, that pull to restrict. So how do we spot a diet in disguise? You know, first red flag is that it promises weight loss, right? Or it focuses on weight loss, especially with intuitive eating. We know that 
three things can happen, right? You can either gain weight, you can either lose weight, or it'll stay the same. But the thing is, it's not the focus because focusing on weight while you're trying to, you know, maybe you're new to intuitive eating and you started this process, but you just still feel stuck. Feels like this intuitive eating journey is going to last forever. You know, I would challenge you, am I still focused on weight loss? Because focusing on that while trying to eat intuitively will definitely make it hard with those efforts because intuitive eating is all about changing your behaviors with food, your relationship with food. It's not about changing your body and it's learning to trust that your body has that internal wisdom and really tap into that. Um, so the second red flag is that a program teaches just eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, right? And I see this sometimes people try to turn intuitive eating into a diet, right? Just eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full. So for example, maybe you're you've seen a program or something out there that's saying, eat whatever you want, right? It's saying, this is a lifestyle. You can eat whatever you want. But if you're still hungry, you must only eat veggies, right? So it's missing that flexibility and that satisfaction piece that is talked about in intuitive eating. So recognizing that hunger and fullness are only one part of the puzzle. And so if you're feeling stuck along this, like I'm eating when I'm hungry, I'm stopping when I'm full, Remember, that's just a very small part of looking at that whole process, right? It's kind of like how when, when some people look at health, they look at nutrition, they look at fitness. Two big parts, but at the same time, very small parts when we're looking at the bigger puzzle of things that impact our health. Um, a third red flag to look out for is that it gives you a list of foods to choose from, right? It says, eat intuitively from this list. Because with intuitive eating, we focus on giving ourselves that unconditional permission to eat. And this is so, 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 I can't emphasize this enough. This is so individual. This cannot be dictated by anyone else but you, right? So can you look at foods as neutral, taking into account your you know, cultural preferences, your own experiences? No food is good. No food is bad, right? And if you look at all foods as neutral, that allows you to make the best decision for you. Um, number four is that if there's an end point, right? If there is something out there that's saying 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, right? <laughs> Remember, long game. We are in it for the long haul, right? Because we know that health is a continuum, right? It's, it's just like, you know, exercise and movement you got to keep, you got to keep moving, right? We don't just like move once and get the benefits and that's it. It's a continuum, right? And as your experiences around food change, you're, there's so much that's changing. And so we just keep moving and we evolving and it's not a start and stop. And then the last piece, you know, huge red flag to look out for is if it includes any form of restriction, whether it's a type of food, um, such as limiting carbs, or, you know, you can have chocolate, but only dark chocolate or if it's portions, you know, I've seen this a lot, you know, you can have anything, but just put it in these containers. Well, that's still a form of restriction. So let's go through, you know, five quick things that you can do to help you actually take steps away full towards, you know, wow, am I still dieting? So number one, we've got to identify, you know, okay, am I still dieting? Um, some signs you might still be restricting is, Maybe you're logging your food. Um, maybe you're avoiding certain foods. Maybe you're eating only certain foods, right? Maybe you're eating a lot of the same foods for reasons, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but eating on a schedule, you know, ignoring your hunger, using the scale, exercising for calories or supplement. Maybe you're still taking supplements um, with hopes of weight loss. And so can you identify, am I actually letting my hunger drive my eating? Um, am I letting my fullness, you know, am I using food as a coping mechanism? Do I eat while distracted, right? Recognizing, okay, what are some signs that are still pulling me back in that, in that diet mindset? And another good way to look at this is asking yourself, do I still have some of those food rules? Do I count anything, calories, points, carbs, etc.? I've found personally for many clients that they say they're not dieting yet because they've dieted so long in the past, they've got like an internal calorie counter or an internal macro counter. And so while they may not be writing things down, 
they're still kind of counting in their heads. Um, you know, asking yourself, what determines how much do I eat? Is it a serving size? Um, is it others around me that are dictating how much or when I eat? Am I setting limits on um, time of day that I eat? Are there certain foods, food groups that I'm still limiting? Um, what about beverages? I think that's an area that we often forget about. Do I allow myself to, to you know, have the coffee drink that sounds good or am I only choosing sugar-free syrups, things like that? Um, and then of course, you know, looking at foods is considering, you know, healthy or safe, but identifying and really taking inventory, where are some of these areas that I might still be feeling stuck? Number three, a big, big step is to cultivate some of that self-compassion, you know, asking yourself when it comes to food, when it comes to body, would I say this to a loved one? You know, and I, I always ask, what would you say? Like, what would you say if in, if you're in a situation around food or your body, what would you say to a loved one, a friend, uh, a daughter, a sister, right? You would probably say something kind. Um, you know, and I have a lot of clients who say, well, I, I can't say, I, I can say this to them, but it's really hard for me to say to myself. The fact that you can come up with something to say to somebody else, that tells me that you have compassion. That tells me that it's there. You are not cold hearted, right? Like you have the ability. It just might take a little bit of practice for you to practice that compassion for yourself. Um, part of this, you know, is taking a look at that self-talk, right? What's going on between the ears? Am I using self-criticism or bullying as a motivator for my eating issues, right? Kind of like bullying yourself into eating one way or another way, um, what compassionate words or phrases could I use to replace some of that dialogue? Um, so the awareness is definitely the, the big step here in order to create that compassion. You know, I, again, go back to weighing the pros and cons of dieting, right? Because along this journey, remember, I always tell people that you can go back to dieting at any time, right? Like, remember, this is not a start and stop, but always kind of go back when you're feeling that pull to diet, when you're feeling all that noise around you getting so loud literally take a piece of paper down and write down, maybe pull back out that timeline that you just created and go, huh, okay, hold on. How has dieting affected my social life? How has it impacted the way I actually behave around food? How has it impacted my brain, my mood, my mental health? Um, how has it impacted my physical health? You know, have you had some of those physical symptoms of, of dieting? Um, my brain space, my relationships, you know, and if you can make a pros and cons list, right, recognizing that you're allowed to feel how you want to feel, you know, a lot, there's, there's times that maybe dieting has shown up in your life, and it's been a way of protecting yourself. You know, it's been the only way that you're able to control in a really stressful situation. And that was, you know, felt comforting for you. If we can recognize that, you know, okay, maybe there was a time in life where it, it served its purpose, right? And, um, was it the healthiest? No, but it served its purpose. But I know that how I felt then is not how I want to feel now, right? And if you can look at that, sometimes looking at that tangible pen to paper and reflecting on that can make it very easy to then go, yeah, no, that program's a diet. I'm not going back there because I've been there before. I felt that pain and I don't want to feel that pain and that yuck feeling that, that I've experienced for you know maybe way too long. Oops, that should be a five. I can't count. <laughs> and then last number five, you know, biggest takeaway is, can you start with letting go of one thing? One thing. Maybe it's a scale, right? And maybe you're like, you know, I've walked into Clarity and I see the smash scales on the wall and I'm not there yet. But can you maybe go from weighing yourself weekly to maybe once a month? Maybe you can just put the scale away, right? Maybe you're not very smashed, but like, can you put it away? Can you, maybe you've got an app still on your phone and maybe you don't track all the time, but it's kind of there when you think about it, can you delete it? Can you, you know, when you go out to a restaurant, are you always looking at salads? Are you always like going straight to um, what's the lowest calorie food? Can you, can you maybe at a restaurant this week go, nope, I'm going to, I'm not going to look at the menu ahead of time. I'm going to show up. I'm going to choose what I want, right? Like that sounds so simple, 
but I want you to think about, can I identify any patterns in my thoughts and my behaviors? Maybe it's the language that you use and just start with one thing. Start with one thing that you focus on this week because it's in those small changes, you know, those small, tiny little things, right? That we do repetitive all the, all the time, those add up. And that's how we really change. You know, we've got that neuroplasticity in our brain when we can rewire our brain. Just like I said about, you know, talking about that self-talk in your head, you can do that same way that you look at food. You can change the way that you look at food, that you speak around food, that you think around food in your body as well. Um, but it does, it takes practice and it takes, you know, showing up to things like this on a regular basis, plugging into your community, people who can hold you accountable and remind you of like, again, I've been there before. I've been in that situation that didn't feel good. And I don't want to go back there. I think that's really important. So I'm big on quotes and I love this quote because I think it really puts, you know, puts things into perspective, but we will not be healthier both psychologically and physically about our food until we learn to love it more not less, with a relaxed, generous, unashamed emotion. In the process, it may be that we will have to redefine fundamentally the concept of eating well. Because again, you know, I think you're, you're maybe at a point in, in your life and your health journey of you've got to rewrite that story, you know, just because you've looked and you've thought about, about food and health as one way for many years in your life, maybe your family all thinks it that way, right? Every, every of your friends think health looks a certain way. Remember, you get to rewrite that chapter. And so, okay, I, I lied. One last um, exercise we're going to do, because again, I'm very big on, like I said, that mindset piece and reflecting on your own journey. So plot your um, notebooks again. And I want you to think about a day without food, without body, without exercise obsessions or thoughts. So imagine you are a young child again. You don't even know how to be ashamed about your body type. When you move, you just want to play. It's not about regimented exercise. When you eat, you eat what there is and you get back to playing. What would a day look like if you were at ease, at peace with your body size and the foods that you ate? When would you wake up? What would you do that day? What friends would you see that day? What would you eat? Would you have more snacks and meals than you usually do or less? Would you move that day? What would it look like in terms of self-care? Would you work? So again, you can, I encourage you, you should take much longer than two minutes to do this, but Right, really take some time to think down and visualize and write out that perfect day and you know, ask yourself, how different is this day than the day I'm living now? You know, did I have more brain space to think about the things that I valued and I cared about more than maintaining a certain body size? You know, what is what was your eating pattern like? Did you did you eat more meals? Did you have less? Did you find yourself having more time to do the things that fulfill you? You know, what were your emotions throughout a day like that? Did you have a lot of dread? Did you have a lot of ease, joy, sadness? And, you know, ultimately on, on that perfect day, when you lay down your head at night, how'd you feel? And, you know, maybe you're doing this exercise and it's hard. You know, I've had, I've had many people go through this exercise and be like, I can't think back to a day. Like I can't think about a time as a child where I had a good relationship around food and body. And, you know, if you're there, I hear you, I see you, right. I, you're not alone, but remember that you, you're an adult now, right. And you get to rewrite that story. You know, you get to be the one if dieting, if that, that diet mentality has been um, a common theme in your family in your life and your history, you, you get, can be the person, right, who stops that, who stops that, um, not just for yourself, but for your family, for your loved ones. And, you know, but it starts with you, right? It starts with doing that internal work, those things like you're just doing now, writing things down, reflecting, processing. And again, in the moment, things like this don't feel like a big deal. But I promise you, over time, that consistency, those light bulbs and those dots start to connect. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, huh, I didn't think about food today. 
I just say what I wanted and I feel good. Right. And it's, I know that sounds crazy, but Abby's not in her head. Like, uh-huh, uh-huh. It, it happens. So here again, are just some more resources, you know, books, podcasts, um, all the things I have a podcast as well. Um, shameless plug where we talk, you know, all things, all things from a non-diet lens, but even again, like I said, on social media, on Instagram, follow some of those hashtags, fill up your feed with stuff that, you know, think about those things that you do on a daily basis. If you're on social media, if you read, if you listen to podcasts and what can, you know, can you get more of this lens of information? Because again, you're going to hear information and you're going to hear from different people in different ways, different statistics, all that. And it's going to hit you at a time where then one day it just goes light bulb. Right. And, um, but again, it takes time, you know, just like I give the example, you know, if you had a friend and every day that you said to her or him, you said, uh, I don't like you, you're ugly, you'll never be good at anything, right? You said that to them every day. And then one day you're like, I love you, you're beautiful, it's fine. Would they believe you? No, they think you are a liar, you are full of it. And so that same thing when it comes to, you know, getting away from that diet mentality if all of a sudden you read a book and you're like, well, just eat this, you know, let's, even I'm hungry, stop and I'm full, right? All those principles don't diet. That's not the simple, right? It takes time. It takes consistency. It takes compassion to really get to that good place um, with, with your body and your brain. So um, again, don't forget, uh, we do have a free community group every first and third Monday of the month. I lead the first Monday of the month. Melissa, she's another dietitian who leads on the third Monday of the month. You're always welcome. We will dive into, you know, intuitive eating. And again, how do I actually put these things into practice in my everyday life? Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. There's my email. I love to hang out on Instagram. Amazing. Well, thank you all so, so much for jumping in. I'm going to send two links. The first one is our teachable course in case you're interested in that 10 week program or know any clients that might be interested. And then online, I'm typing it out. Clarityfitness.com is our virtual platform where Katie's amazing community groups, as well as some really awesome other body positive community groups, all these body positive workouts are housed. It's basically a fitness platform and a mental health platform in one. So we're really, really proud and excited about this platform. It's all body positive, health at every size informed. And I want to send a giant thank you to Katie for her time today and answering all of our amazing questions. You crushed it. I'm so excited. Wow, thank to get this you. Thank you guys for joining. Absolutely. This was so, so, so fun. And for everyone, so everyone's nerves are quelled. All of the Q&A will get cut. That's confidential just for our conversations and just the actual content is going to go on YouTube. So if you want to share what we chatted about today, you can check out the Clarity Fitness YouTube page and forward it on and revisit it if you need a refresher. And thank you again so, so much, Katie. We appreciate you. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.